Hi, I'm Josh Young with Bison Interests, and this is our June oil macro update. This is a brief disclaimer. Um, it's worth noting this isn't an offering of any securities or funds. The goal here is to share some of our insights and thoughts on the oil market um, and, and what may have changed since our last update. So like I mentioned, the uh, goal here is to, to share some updated thoughts on the oil and gas market. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to do that in an abbreviated fashion here, and hopefully you find this useful. So a little about us before, uh, before going ahead. So when we look at uh, sector experts and others, um, we try to understand their performance and uh, track record in order to calibrate their views and to try to better sort of uh, place them in our mosaic. And so we can't share our fund track record, but what we can do is share the performance of ideas that I've talked about on TV or in other sort of very public formats over the last couple of years. And this chart shows that versus XOP, which is the uh, relative uh, or relevant uh, benchmark uh, ETF that uh, that these could be compared against. And so again, goal here isn't to say, hey, we're amazing. It's more just, hey, we think that we know what we're talking about in regards to the oil and gas market and related equities. So one of the things that's been happening in the oil and gas market that we think is maybe the most interesting is that the equities have materially lagged both the broader uh, stock market over the last number of years, as well as the price of oil. This disconnect really picked up in the last couple of years, uh, but has been going on since the oil market crash in 2014. And one of the things that's worth noting is that if the price of oil stayed flat for these equities to essentially catch up, they would have to go up multiple times, particularly the smaller cap equities. And if one were to believe that this is a typical cycle, you, you might expect that oil and gas equities might actually outperform versus the broader market from their prior peak. And so there might be room for those equities to outperform even more, possibly by them trading up, possibly by the market trading down, indicated here uh, with the S&P 500 index, um, or some combination in a process that's described as mean reversion. It doesn't always happen, but um, it does seem like there's a particularly interesting opportunity here, particularly for smaller cap oil and gas stocks. So one misconception that I, I think is, is interesting, and, and someone asked me this today uh, about this, the, the forward curve shows that oil prices are lower a year from now than they are today. Like you can go sell June 2023 oil for $90 a barrel, or you can buy it, uh, a contract to purchase it at that price. And that doesn't mean that oil will necessarily trade at $90 a barrel in June of 2023. It just means that you can buy that right today or sell that right today. Um, what this shows is that in over time, when the oil market has offered oil for sale for cheaper in the future than it costs uh, today, um, it's actually meant that, or it's been correlated with increases in the price of oil, not decreases. So oil at 110, uh, a year out, it oil at 90, you might actually see oil prices rise in between now and next year rather than fall to that $90 level. And as you can see over time, that sort of disconnect has actually been associated with price increases, not price decreases. Another big misconception, I think, is that people look at um, the reports from the EIA, from the IEA, various government agencies and sort of quasi-governmental agencies and advisory groups, and they, they see in these reports that things are fine or that there's uh, adequately supplied oil markets and then that, you know, the energy transition or other sorts of projects that are politically favorable uh, are going well or, or can, can proceed sort of on plan. And one of the things we've noticed is that the EIA in particular has had to revise their estimates for OECD commercial inventories. So basically the 
oil that's available in inventories to sell, they've had to revise them down repeatedly. And what that means is that the oil market is less well supplied than the EIA, a government agency, is reporting. And that there, when you see this sort of pattern where they have to revise down over and over and over again, I think it, it calls into question to some extent some of the forecasts that they're providing, obviously, and then also makes you think that maybe the oil market is tighter than they'd like us to think and that maybe there's there's a problem here. So again, this trend is pretty powerful. This isn't really something that's talked about too much and is something to keep in mind when considering which forecasts uh, to rely on and sort of where information is coming from. So one other factor that's very interesting is the open interest in oil futures and what that looks like versus um, the oil price. And so what we've seen is that over the last few years, oil prices have risen, especially since uh, early 2020, um, but the speculative interest in oil futures has actually fallen. And this means that the price may, may actually rise quite a bit, um, even if speculative speculative activity doesn't increase, even if it just sort of reverts to sort of normal levels. And if speculative activity were to increase in line with how much oil has risen, it could force oil prices much higher. So less activity in the market, again, isn't always bullish, but it does, it kind of tilts things. So if activity were to resume and if patterns were to sort of normalize with speculative activity versus price, um, that could lean prices much higher versus much lower. Similar sort of chart, very interesting. Um, it, and again, I think, I think this sort of shows it uh, in another way, but same sort of potential for a re-rate higher in price as net speculative positions could potentially rebound. So another pretty big factor that I think is getting a little more coverage now, but has been something that's had me interested and invested in oil and gas companies uh, for, for a while, is this slowdown in industry capital expenditures. And so I think, I think it helps to actually see this over a multi-year period like we're showing here and to see just how much money hasn't been spent versus how much had been spent historically. And there's been some criticism that, hey, maybe 2014 isn't the right year to base things off of. But given the, the current state of the oil market, it, it kind of it helps to understand how much less was spent after 2014 and 2015. And when you consider that, it makes a lot more sense in terms of how undersupplied the market is and sort of what, what may be coming next. So before that was sort of overall industry spend, this change shown in this chart is actually maybe even more interesting, which is that the trend has been, uh, the trend historically had been for oil and gas producers to spend more than they made in order to grow production, which was rewarded in the market and was rewarded in transactions. And the, the recent quite powerful trend, which doesn't seem to be changing too much, is to spend a small fraction of the money that's made and to take the rest of it and to pay off debt and to return capital to shareholders. And you know this does coincide. We showed that small cap producers, are their stocks are down 80 something percent from where they were in 2014. And even the large cap producers are down over 50% since 2014 versus the stock market being up like we showed about 100% since then. So it does make sense that producers would not really have the sanction of their shareholders or other capital providers to outspend. And what may happen is even in a period of high prices and a tight oil market, there may be continued pressure on these producers to return capital until the point where they've returned enough capital and underspent enough that they've uh, sort of made up for the very large losses that were incurred in the very painful time uh, of being an oil and gas investor on the equity side, especially over the last number of years. And so one, one other thing that I think people almost always miss, and, and we, we showed people this slide a few months ago, and, and I don't think they even really understood what they were seeing. So I'll, I'll try to do a good job of explaining this. Um, the big oil and gas services companies, uh, 
have slowed down dramatically on their spend. And I like this chart because it goes back even to 2010. Um, the peak for spend actually for Halliburton, Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, um, their, their peak spend was actually in 2012. And then you can see in 2014, there was another big year. From their peak in 2012, their capital spend was down 77% uh, by 2021. And it's rebounding a little bit in 22, but still a, a small fraction of where that was uh, in the last up cycle. And this is important because this is the spend that's necessary to figure out how to implement new technologies, how to drill sort of uh, harder to get to formations, how to solve difficult problems with engineering, uh, both with drilling as well as completions, infrastructure, uh, production challenges. And so this whole sort of combination of things, when you're not spending that much on solving these problems, you build up a set of problems that need to get solved. And it, it really, this is, I think, a, a sort of early indicator or easy indicator of some of the spending that needs to happen before the upstream industry can actually ramp up their spend a lot before you can see with some lag production increase. So again, this is, it's not just about the producers, it's about the services capacity being eviscerated. And this is essentially the intellectual capital, and this is sort of the highest end aspect of that services business. This doesn't even include drilling rigs and uh, pressure pumping and offshore uh, drill boats and so on that are extremely capital intensive. This is some of the higher end uh, sort of uh, intellectual property sort of stuff and that's been materially underspent on. So again, big hole from a capital perspective means it's going to take a while, especially because the services providers have been underspending in addition to the upstream uh, oil and gas uh, exploration and production companies. The, the labor shortages in the industry are also a very real problem. And this was a problem you can see this, this uh, survey was from 2019. Um, there's, there's real issues in the industry. It certainly doesn't help that politicians and business leaders talk about the oil and gas industry going away uh, soon in terms of attracting talent to come in and figure out some of the difficult problems that I was talking about, uh, figuring out how to access new formations or being able to get through pre-salt offshore or other sorts of really uh, challenging issues. And you need people and a lot of the people that you need to do these things in order to be able to develop and grow production or even sustain existing production. A lot of those people have retired or been laid off and finding enough people just to replace the people leaving this year is proving quite challenging for producers and services companies. And so, you know, labor is probably one of the biggest constraints to ramping up production and it's really keeping this oil market very tight. So if, if there's one slide to, to keep in mind from this presentation, it would be this one. We're showing the long-term trajectory of oil demand, which is that oil demand has grown roughly 1 million barrels a day or a little over 1% a year for a very long time. If you zoomed out and looked back to the 70s, it's basically been growing, well, actually since the early 80s, it's been growing at about that rate. And so um, there was a big disruption during COVID and there was, a big, uh, there was a big surplus of production. Essentially, demand was shocked down when governments shut down their countries and didn't allow people to travel or go to work. And so what we're seeing is as this reopening has happened, demand has recovered faster than supply. And so we went from a surplus to a deficit and that trajectory is continuing and it's why you see oil being depleted from commercial inventories like we showed earlier. Um, and it's why um, it's why you may see oil prices go much higher. Just if demand rises faster than the supply and you deplete your inventories, at some point you sort of run out of the available product. And when demand is greater than supply, you end up with having a high enough price that it allows the market to clear. It's basically Econ 101. So one other sort of uh, way to think about the oil market that, that I think is, is a little different from how we think about it here in the US. And you know I think 
maybe helps in terms of why oil demand isn't falling, even with very high gasoline and diesel prices, particularly in emerging market countries where people have trouble, where there's just a lot less income. And so um, higher gasoline prices, especially because of the rise of the U.S. dollar relative to some of those currencies, um, you know, you're at already all time high gasoline and diesel in, let's say, Indian rupees or um, other other such currencies. What, what you see is that the energy consumption in those countries is at a small fraction of the consumption per person per year uh, that you see in the U.S. and other developed countries. And so what you're seeing is people choosing to spend more where they can. Uh, to be able to, let's say, take a scooter to bring their food to the market or to do some other sort of commercial endeavor where, where there's huge returns typically on that investment or on that spend. And, you know, if it costs $10 a gallon, once you've bought that $200 or $300 scooter in India, if it costs $10 a gallon for your gasoline or $5 a gallon for your gasoline, and you're using one gallon a month or one gallon a week or whatever that is, um, it doesn't actually matter that much. It just matters more that you're able to use the uh, gas powered device or diesel powered device uh, for the intended use. And so um, there's really, really high returns from an energy expenditure perspective as you're on the low side of energy consumption. And I think it's important to remember that high energy prices have real human costs. And so the goal of this isn't to advocate for there being less energy available um, but it is it is worth remembering sort of who the incremental, who the marginal consumer is of oil and gas. It's not really the getting in the car to go to the grocery store. I mean, that, that happens kind of no matter what here in the U.S. Um, it's more sort of this, this edge use case where there are people who use less, uh, the famous line is they use less electricity or less energy than your refrigerator in their whole life. And so, you know, very important to remember and just the, the returns on that expenditure are so high that it's gonna happen to some extent and we're seeing all time high consumption uh, in some countries, uh, even with all time high prices. So, if there is one other chart, so this is probably the second most important chart to uh, to focus on in this presentation. Um, this is oil price versus oil inventories measured on a day's supply basis. So basically, how many days worth of oil supply is there, and what's the price for oil? And no surprise, as days supply has fallen. The price has risen and so again it's a sort of very simple idea in terms of demand and supply being matched via price price being sort of the clearing mechanism for supply and demand but you know it's very simple but also very important people seem to forget it and you know these lines don't perfectly match but we tried to adjust the scale to sort of help visualize what's happening and as we see oil inventories fall, especially um, as the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is tapped, which we've excluded from this, but as that's tapped, it actually reduces the theoretically available amount of oil in an emergency or under sort of many other circumstances, and it could force the price even higher. So this trajectory and, and kind of what you can see on a multi-year basis, especially since the peak in 2020, this trajectory is, much lower oil inventories, especially measured as day supply, and much higher oil prices. Uh, th this is another sort of way to, to look at the, the same thing. If you look at where oil was, uh, where oil inventories were uh, at different time periods, this it can help sort of calibrate where you might think oil prices should be. And this, this excludes, this sort of consideration excludes inflation and it excludes some other factors. But if you look at where oil was, oil inventories were uh, kind of in the 2016 to 21 timeframe, uh, they were at a level that indicated, you know, maybe a appropriate price a lot lower than the current price. But with where oil inventories are here, and again, this is not including the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is being depleted by about a million barrels a day at this point, 
um, with not that many more days left to go before it would be empty. Um, you know, this this big decline in oil inventories in the U.S. is forcing oil prices up, like we showed in the last chart. And as it declines further, there is the potential for oil prices to rise much higher than they rose or than they were in that 2010 to 2015 time frame. The one other chart on here that I think is worth considering is we are releasing oil from the, from the SPR, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. When that's happened historically, we've seen in many cases, it's essentially backfired and it sent oil prices higher over time. And as there have been these different SPR releases over the last six months or so, each release, or I guess eight months now, each release and announcement has had less time of oil prices falling and uh, there's been sort of less of a gap between when it's been announced and when oil prices start rising again. So it is worth noting SPR releases are oddly positively correlated with higher oil prices. So one of the factors like we showed in terms of why oil production is lower than oil consumption and sort of why that trajectory is uh, continuing is that there's not enough spending by the oil and gas producers and that spending isn't happening partly because service capacity isn't fully there and partly because the returns were so poor for these oil and gas companies that it's necessary for the companies to earn excess profits essentially to return that just to make up for all the excess losses that they incurred for so many years. So we see this in the drilling rig count too. Um, and you can see that the drilling rig count has essentially um, separated from and, and lost some of the correlation with the oil price. We do expect that the oil price being this high will drag the oil rig count higher over time, but I don't, I don't know that we'll see producers start spending 100% of their cash flow anytime soon. And with that as a constraint, that is really keeping the rig count down quite a bit. So even with that rise in rig count, we're not seeing as much production growth as we might have expected. And a big factor there are drilled uncompleted wells. So a number of wells were drilled in a lower price environment and the producers weren't in a rush to spend the money to frack them and then to tie them in and bring the production online. And so what's been happening is as producers have been pressured to spend less money, but still produce as much as they had planned, they've been taking their inventory of wells that they had drilled and not yet completed, and they've been completing those wells and turning them on. And so that's allowed the drilling rig count to be lower than it might have been otherwise, and it's also allowed producers to show capital efficiency that's probably not indicative of their sort of full cycle capital efficiencies. So this is an important aspect of the oil market today, globally even, because the US side and Canadian to lesser extent is still catching up on this duct depletion, even as rig counts rise. In a lot of cases, it's just to make up for the excess completion activity that was happening. And we may need even more rigs just to keep current activity levels and current production trajectories in line. So again, higher rig counts don't necessarily mean what they meant in prior years. And we may actually need another roughly 80 to 100 rigs just to make up for the stock depletion that we've seen before the industry can get back into more of a growth and uh, uh, I guess increasing production in line with oil price mode. So one other thing that's worth considering, and um, it's something that we've, we've become somewhat known for. Uh, last year, we put out some analysis on, on OPEC plus and their uh, rapidly depleting spare capacity. And so there's been this sort of misconception, and I think it's not really doing OPEC any favors at this point as various countries pressure them to spend more or to, sorry, bring more production online. And they've represented that there's millions of barrels a day of more capacity that they have that they're choosing not to bring on. And this chart shows the amount of oil that they've agreed to bring on, that OPEC plus has agreed to bring onto the market, um, versus the amount 
that they've actually brought on. It's showing the miss in their quota uh, production. And it is interesting because historically OPEC would set an amount and then various member countries would cheat. And it was sort of this very interesting that, that we talked about in my game theory class at University of Chicago, um, you know, as a very sort of interesting problem to try to get enough participation to your expectation is that everyone's going to cheat and that this chart would look flipped, that there would be a little bit of cheating for a while and then a lot of cheating. What we're seeing here is the opposite. We're seeing a little bit of missing and then a lot of missing. And this is even with May production for Russia having rebounded to some extent. And so this tells us, in addition to the analysis that we shared, that OPEC really does look like they're close to out of their spare production capacity. And as their deal unwinds, and as global demand continues to increase as the world reopens uh, post COVID and as emerging markets and other countries uh, continue their trajectory of oil demand growth, um, th this could be a real issue and this could be something that could reset oil prices radically higher and is worth tracking. So like I mentioned, uh, Russian oil production started to rebound in May. Um, there are some indications that their production might be even higher in June. There's not great data. We're tracking some of the tanker data and other data that may indicate that you know there, there is higher Russian production currently. Our expectation is that Russian production will roll off over time uh, as sanctions take hold and as underinvestment and uh, lack of technology and expertise and capital uh, from the, the sanctions that are already in place uh, start to kick in. And, and some of the Russian fields are particularly high decline and very uh, complex. And so the expectation is even if Chinese services firms and other services firms come in and try to step in and, and take uh, take over what Halbert and Schlumberger and Baker Hughes and Weatherford were doing, um, that they're, they're not going to be as effective, both from a capital efficiency perspective, as well as from an operational efficiency perspective. So we do think that this production comes down. It may be up a little um, in the next month or two or three, but, but there is sort of this uh, downward pressure. And so it's worth tracking, but it is really interesting that even with higher Russian production than expected, OPEC missed even more than, uh, frankly, even than we expected. So it's, it's worth watching. And this is something that's increasingly in the news, increasingly controversial, oddly, and something that seems quite obvious to us and has for a little while. So one other thing that's worth considering as you, as you think about the oil market and sort of where supply and demand might meet and, and therefore dictate price um, is that there is a concurrent energy crisis happening worldwide. And so what that means is that there's insufficient natural gas being delivered to Europe. Insufficient gas to Europe means insufficient gas to Asia because liquef liquefied natural gas cargoes are, are being redirected from Asia to Europe. It's messing up uh, coal pricing. Coal prices are at all-time highs for some blends in some markets uh, or some, some uh, varieties in some markets. And what we're showing in this is the spread between the European natural gas price, the oil price, the Brent oil price, um, and US natural gas prices. And what we're showing is that this spread is very wide, which means that if any uh, consumer of natural gas is able to consume oil instead, they're going to do it because it costs less than 50% of their natural gas price to consume oil. If they're able to somehow, if it's a very energy intensive thing, if they're able to somehow shift their operations to the US or Canada, where the Henry Hub uh, price is relevant and dominant at $36 a barrel equivalent, um, or 37 or whatever it is at this moment, um, that's, that's very compelling versus $246 per barrel equivalent. And so um, this is driving up demand for oil and it's having spillover, spillover effects on the economy and on industrial activity 
and on various other things. And this is how you can see it's a real crisis as uh, they're potentially going to be rationing gas in Europe. There have been blackouts and other sorts of issues this past winter. And this, this coming winter could be even worse. And frankly, even this summer, there could be some power issues in Europe and Asia and other places. We're seeing riots in Sri Lanka um, and various other emerging market countries that are less wealthy and less able to subsidize the energy consumption of their people. And so, you know, this is really worth watching. And this indicates to us that oil prices may be way too low and that Brent may have substantial upside. And we understand that this is maybe not a popular view, uh, both because oil is a contributor to inflation and because oil prices just gapped down in the last couple of weeks. But we looked at this last winter when there was an Omicron fear and when oil prices fell substantially and there was sort of almost a panic in oil and gas equities. We see a similar sort of phenomenon here. There's almost a panic in oil and gas equities. Oil prices are down. And yet one of the biggest incremental demand drivers is on fire. It's European natural gas is way higher than, than it's been pretty much ever, both for this time of year and historically. And it's driving incremental oil demand. And again, this is, this is really worth watching and considering when you think about the oil market. One other factor, and this isn't um, perfect, uh, there, there are always data issues. And uh, as, as we're recording this, the Energy Information Association, they, uh, the EIA has not, or Energy Information Administration, regardless, <laughs> they uh, haven't released their oil inventories for over a week. They blamed a voltage issue for their computers, um, but this is just, it's highly irregular. Anyway, so they've been a good uh, source of data for oil inventories and implied demand, um, which is a, a way to approximate essentially oil use. And another way has been from gas buddy and has been from various other sort of uh, data sources. So this chart is from the EIA, but it's a little, a little dated. What it shows is that gasoline prices, um, gasoline prices have risen and consumption has not fallen. And actually the most updated data I believe would show that gas uh, consumption has actually risen pretty substantially recently, despite higher prices. This shows that that the cons consumption and demand is essentially not particularly price elastic. That when you're going to go to the grocery store, you're going to go kind of regardless if of if gas is four dollars a gallon or six dollars a gallon. You need to go and. The alternatives aren't great and grocery delivery services also use gasoline they're just they price it in into their um into their ordering system or, or through their other pricing mechanisms so you end up with it uh with with that sort of consumption either way and uh is similar with commuting to work or driving for other sorts of activities the observation is that over time consumption loss is very low versus price. And we're actually seeing that right now in this chart. And the current data is actually arguably even more compelling. Another consideration there in, in terms of gasoline and just keeping in mind sort of what sort of demand destruction there might be. Right now, um, the refining margins, the crack spread is, is very wide. They're very high. And um, there are various factors for that, but many of those factors seem to be temporary. And as refining margins come back down to sort of their more typical or average levels over the last number of years, um, we think it's likely that as gasoline prices fall, uh, oil prices may rise. And one of the interesting things, and, and essentially maybe even keep gasoline prices flat-ish, except with the margin going to oil producers rather than to refiners. And so, and again, there's a number of different factors there. There's a number of one-time items that have really pressured uh, refining capacity lower and have pressured refining margins way higher. And you can see over a long period of time that these uh, crack spreads were a lot lower. And so, um, the, the thought here, again, is, is not so much making a call on refining other than that just reversion to the mean is a pretty powerful trend. 
and that there are some factors in the refining market that um, are a little less um, challenging than in the oil production market, uh, but that refined products are showing us that consumers will keep buying even at implied prices of $200 a barrel or higher. And so it's a very interesting sort of experiment. We've seen a small amount of consumption uh, getting pushed off, or some people are calling it demand destruction. Um, but by and large, we're seeing a successful market test of $200 oil through current high gasoline prices relative to oil prices and just the absolute level of gasoline prices. And so I think, I think there's a reasonable expectation that oil prices could go much higher. And if the economy were to be similar to the current circumstance, that that would not force any additional consumption offline. So basically, gasoline's pricing in essentially $200 a barrel, diesel's pricing in essentially $200 a barrel. There's no reason why over time, oil can't be $200 a barrel or more. So one, one last thought, and that's um, that there's a major sector rotation that may be underway. And so, um, you know, Oil and gas stocks, energy stocks are a small percentage of the market. Uh, this shows 5%. I think it's actually even less than that right now. Um, technology stocks are 27%. And if you calculate certain other sectors more similar, similarly to how they used to be calculated, maybe it would be close to 40%. Um, and what you can see is over time, and this chart goes back to 1980, uh, the, these things fluctuate cyclically, and there's a reasonable argument that energy should go to 8 or 10%. And possibly, if this energy crisis gets as bad as the energy crisis did in the 70s, and there's arguments that it could actually be worse, and there's arguments it could be less bad. But to the extent that it gets anywhere close to what, where it was in the 70s and early 80s, you can see that energy was close to 25% of the S&P 500 at at one point in the early 1980s and if we saw that that would mean oil and gas stocks at 5x potentially or more relative to where they're they're currently priced uh, assuming that the market the broader market didn't collapse and if the broader market were to fall maybe it would be oil and gas stocks up two or three times and the broader market down considerably so there there is a lot of room to to run here for this potential mean uh, reversion and uh this isn't something that people spend too much time thinking about from what I can tell. And it's worth considering when you think about all of these positive factors for the oil market, the potential significant move in oil prices and how much oil and gas stocks have lagged versus oil prices and the broader market. So with that, thank you very much for, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Uh, please be sure to check us out at bisoninterest.com or on Twitter at bisoninterest. Thank you.